This is my personal recording of the slides that I made for my PhD defense, which was held on the 10th of June 2021. The faculty opponent Hedwig Schellström, who is professor at Royal Institute of Technology, presented the contents originally at the defense. So this is just my take on it, uh, and the thesis is named Reinforcement Learning for Active Visual Perception. So the thesis revolves around visual perception, and an example of this is seen here, where there are some sort of eye fixation patterns of some human subject that was recorded as he or she was watching this video. And we as humans, when we watch, for example, this video, we can draw a lot of conclusions about what's going on. We can see what types of objects are there in the video, what types of actions are the various people performing, uh, what's the colors of the clothing and other objects, what's the lightning, and overall the general context, and we can even predict sort of <clears throat> the big picture of what's going on in, in, in this context. And we use visual perception uh, in our daily lives to do all sorts of tasks. So it's a very fundamental problem, which in the context of artificial intelligence and computer vision is uh, trying to be tackled. Uh, so essentially the goal is to come up with machines or algorithms that can perform similar things automatically. So in this thesis, uh, a few different perception tasks are considered, and uh, we will just briefly mention them here as they will sort of uh, be a fundamental part of the thesis itself. So the first step of uh, the, uh, the task that is considered is object detection. And in that task, uh, the goal is essentially to detect all the different objects that are in the image as well as where in the image that they are. So this is a two-part thing. First, we localize, which means essentially that we draw a bounding box around the objects in the image. And then the second part is to classify or tell what is in uh, the respective bounding boxes that are predicted. So in this example, a dog. In the middle, we have a somewhat more difficult example with sim uh, different types of objects. Uh, and also the illum illumination is somewhat weaker and so on. So we can see that some of the objects are correctly uh, detected, uh, but two of them are not. So for example, there's a white dashed bounding box around one of the cars, which was not even detected at all. And then we have a green dashed box, uh, which was detected, but the label cat is incorrect. It should have been human or person. And in the third example, similarly, we have a few success cases, but also one failure case, which is the yellow dashed box. The problem with that box is sort of the bounding box itself, which is too large relative to what it should have been. Then we have the semantic segmentation task, which is uh, a bit similar at a high level to the detection task. But in this case, we should predict not just bounding boxes, but every pixel we should predict a label for. And this results in, for example, the right example here, where you have an input image and then you get something which has the same shape and size uh, and it typically we don't color every pixel to a unique color, so to say, uh, corresponding to different classes. And um, the third type of task considered is human pose estimation, uh, where the task is to reconstruct sort of uh, joints and skeletons of, of various people, uh, given one or several images. In the thesis, they consider uh, multi multi view systems. But in these examples, we show just examples on single images, and the task can be either in 2D. In the 2D case, you should essentially draw the skeletons on top of the images. And in the 3D setup, you have some sort of 3D world uh, with respect that you're trying to estimate these poses then. And we also see an example there for the 3D case, where not just the skeleton is drawn, but sometimes you also want to estimate uh, more detailed information, such as shape and so on. So the 3D task is also more challenging in general, uh, as we will come back to. So those are some sort of examples of perception that are considered in this thesis. But more broadly speaking, uh, we're looking at the question of like what models are being used to, to do these types of perception tasks. And nowadays, and uh, at least for about a decade now, uh, the main model has been a deep neural network. And there exists a plethora of different such architectures. And we'll, in this slide, we will just give a very brief high-level overview of a typical one, which is based on convolutions and so on. So these architectures, they take an input image, uh, and then they feed them through a series of, let's say, convolutional layers in these examples. The convolutional layers operates kind of in a spatial fashion, which makes sense since these are images. So you would essentially slide some sort of filters across the image, 
um, which then detects sort of some sort of features. And due to the convolutional nature, some sort of spatial uh, elements are preserved as the features are computed. So features are essentially some sort of descriptors of relevant things for, for making a decision of what the image contains. Um, after the convolutions, you would then maybe have a set of fully connected layers. And in the end, you can make some sort of predictions. For example, what does the image contain? In this example, a ship and a person. So one broadly categorizes or divides between using feed forward or recurrent networks. There exists many other variants as well, but we will look briefly into these two. So what we have in, in a typical setup is you have some sample, let's call it X1, which could be, for example, an image. You feed it through a neural network F to get the prediction, which we can call Y hat. What you would do with these networks is that you would like them to get better at their task. So, you know, at the beginning, you have a set of parameters for these large networks that you don't have any idea of how to set them. So you maybe set them to some random weights. And then you would like to somehow train or learn uh, these weights to become better at the given task. So how to do that typically is that you have, let's say, large data sets which contain pairs of images and then some sort of description of those images. And these descriptions are given by humans. So this is called annotation. For example, it could be a description of what is contained in the image, what categories are there. So given these large data sets of such information, you can then compare your prediction y hat to the actual uh, labels provided by these humans. We can call that y. So you would like y hat to be as close to y as possible. And you know you have some sort of loss function which describes that relationship. And you would like to minimize loss, meaning that you would like these to get as close as possible to what the humans say that the images should contain. Um, and the main methodology to, to perform the updates of the weights is based on backpropagation, which is a method for uh, sequentially computing uh, all the gradients of these large networks. And then you have some first order method to, up, uh, to update your, your weights, such, such as stochastic gradient descent. But uh, in one type of scenario, you have these images, which we call X, and sometimes they may not be dependent on each other at all. They could be just some random images from the internet, which you would like to classify. And in such settings, it's very typical to just have a feed for a network. We could contrast to that to another setting. Uh, let's say, for example, video classification, where the frames are clearly dependent on each other. And in such a setup, you would still maybe make some predictions based on some neural network F. <clears throat> but you would also like to propagate some sort of memory between the Fs in this indicated with this dashed arrows. Uh, and then as you update your weights, you would do that both immediately based on the losses, but you also would like to backpropagate the losses through time. And sometimes you have a loss only at the very end. And sometimes, depending on the task, you could also have these intermediate losses for all, for all of the frames. So that's just a very nutshell overview of these perceptual models uh, that are used based on deep learning. Um, and they have given over the decade, last decade state-of-the-art results in almost all parts of computer vision and other parts of machine learning. But they have some sort of, many of these models have at least some sort of drawbacks that we would like to address. Um, and let's look at a few of these that exist in some of them nowadays. So one of them is that you have these deep neural networks which are super large and have oftentimes millions or sometimes billions of parameters. So that requires typically large data sets. Um, and that's a very expensive process to obtain these data sets, both with the images, but specifically to get annotations from the humans to explain what the images contain. And related to that is, you know, many times these models that we train on these data sets, even though those data sets are static and predefined, uh, they may contain inherent biases. So, you know, if, if you train a system on some sort of set of images, it's not clear that the same system would generalize well to other circumstances where, for example, the lightning is worse, or if you attach your, your perception model to some robot which moves around in a more complex environment, uh, then this system may not adapt to, to those new conditions. Um, and then also a third sort of thing which is common is these, these networks, they typically operate kind of uniformly or sometimes exhaustively on, on the input image. So, Depending on the task, you know, a given image or video 
it could be of varying importance what is what is in that video. So <clears throat> many times uh, these systems tend to do redundant computation, and even worse could be that they could make some sort of predictions based on based even on on where these models are uncertain. So there could be settings where they are not clear about what you're predicting, and maybe we would like to avoid uh, using them in such cases. So all of these things are sort of what drives the the thesis forward. It's like revolving around how to improve upon or address some of these challenges, typical perception pipelines. So uh, this is kind of a high level overview of what the thesis is about in one slide. So it is using a technology called reinforcement learning, which we will briefly look at uh, for three of these perception tasks. One of them is object detection. So this type of model that they propose is a bit similar to this this eye fixation video that you saw, because in these settings, uh, they have a system which looks locally at different parts of the images, detect these objects that could be there, and then the process repeats, and then maybe it fixates somewhere else in the image. And in this example, then it has detected the ship and the person in, in two different fixations. And the model would simply repeat to decide where to look next in the image or to terminate the search process. Um, and then the second type of task is active human post estimation, which takes these human post estimation systems and tries to attach them to some sort of observer that can move around or go to different viewpoints. So assume you have a set of different viewpoints indicated with these cameras, and you're given some random viewpoint like this one. And then maybe you would ask the question, where should I go next to improve my estimates? So maybe they then decides to go over here. And based on the viewpoints that it has seen, it would then like to reconstruct the 3D pose estimates of, of for example, this person. And uh, in this particular example, uh, the pose estimation system failed to recognize, for example, the head in the first viewpoint. So, you know, we would like to have systems that can somehow adapt to the inherent <coughs> limits or disadvantages of a given perception model to try to move around to, to get better viewpoints. And the question would be like, where, where should this agent move next to also reconstruct the head and the legs? And another question is, when should it be done? How many viewpoints are sufficient? So the agent would ideally terminate this automatically there as well. And finally, the thesis concludes with sort of establishing a new framework for training these perception models, which is called embodied visual active learning. Here you can imagine some sort of robot, let's say a household robot that moves around in a 3D environment. And then this robot, as it moves around, it gets some sort of observations based on some camera that it has. And it also has a perception model. In this example, we have a semantic segmentation system. So the agent knows what it sees and sort of roughly how well is its perception performing in some sense. And the task of the agent is to uh, selectively request annotations from, let's say, uh, for example, a human in the loop that could pro provide some sort of annotations based on what this agent asks. And since annotations are expensive, it should be very selective about which viewpoints to really ask for. <clears throat> and since reinforcement learning is a central concept in the thesis, let's look at some very brief basics of, of reinforcement learning as before we proceed. So these two things we were showing already in the previous slides. So let's see how RL looks compared to those. So you have some state S0, and then you have a policy, pi of theta, which is some deep neural network typically, and that one predicts an action to take A0 based on the state S0. <clears throat> and based on the taken action and based on the environment dynamics called P, you would then result in a new state S1. And the process would simply repeat until the end of some episode. So the question is, what would the loss functions be in this case? So this is a sequential decision-making problem, which is somewhat dif different from the supervised learning tasks in the left and right figure. So what is proposed in reinforcement learning is to use rewards. So every action could be associated with a small reward, let's call them R1, R2, and so on, associated with taking that particular action. <clears throat> but the thing is that as we have this sequence of actions, you know, what, what the agent decides to do early in the episode could affect the whole future. So we shouldn't only be care about the, um, the immediate reward, but we actually care about the full sum of all the rewards that is obtained from that step onwards. 
So we work with these cumulative rewards, which are called capital R. So we replace the small ones by summing them up instead to these capital R's, and then you would use these capital R's or the cumulative rewards as a sort of replacement, if you will, for the loss function. We will look at that soon, what that really means. But that's kind of a nutshell overview and comparison to the supervised learning setups that we already considered. And so speaking of supervised learning, let's look at an example of a supervised learning task to be able to contrast that with reinforcement learning on the next slide. So in this uh, image, we could, for example, easily see that it contains a motorcycle. The answer would be y equals to one, yes. The neural network, on the other hand, it would simply take the image, feed it through those layers, and then in output some probability y hat of it containing the motorcycle. And what we do in supervised learning typically is we work with these loss functions, in this example, cross entropy, uh, which wants to maximize the correct class probability, maximize the probability of it containing a motorcycle in this example. And you could then plug in the correct answer y into that loss, so to say, and you would like to make sure that y hat becomes more similar to y. We also rewrite it as this j of theta to make it more comparable on the next slide. So it could be seen as a maximization problem. So in a sequential decision-making task, on the other hand, you could have, for example, a game like this, and you should answer, should I move up to increase my chances of winning? And this is not at all as obvious the answer as it was on the previous slide with the motorcycle. So what that means is that we have these loss functions, let's say, call it j again, and the problem is that, okay, we would like to use that for reinforcement learning also, but the problem is we don't know what is the actual why, the ground truth answer, so to say. So in reinforcement learning, what you do is, you know, you take your neural network to get this pr uh, probability y hat, and then you sample from that distribution uh, some sort of action, either one or zero in this example. And you would then use y tilde to replace y. So some, in some sense, you could call y tilde as some sort of fake label. But the problem is, of course, that we don't know if y tilde was good or bad. So previously in the supervised learning example, we knew that y was the correct thing. So we sort of had this invisible plus one to the right of that loss. But in this reinforcement learning example, we need to have a cumulative sum of actual observed rewards as we obtain. So what that means is we would simply increase the probability of good actions and increase it for bad actions. So that's a nutshell overview and comparison of reinforced learning relative to supervised learning. So the main differences are that you have to sample your actions, call them y tilde here, and then sometimes you have to wait a long time until you get some sort of feedback. So those are the, some sort of crucial challenges of reinforcement learning. But we now move on to the second part, which is starting to look at the contributions of the thesis. So the first part of these contributions considered reinforcement learning in the context of object detection. So let's first look at a typical object detection pipeline, which has sort of been the same for quite a long time. Um, so classically and still most commonly, an object detector operates in two stages. So the first stage, that revolves around taking an input image and then sort of coming up or predicting uh, candidate bounding boxes which could then contain objects. So in this stage, you could get very many boxes. It could be hundreds, thousands, or even tens of thousands sometimes. And that also means, obviously, that many of them would contain some sort of background, and some of them could then contain some relevant information. So for the second step in the detection pipeline, you would try to classify each of these bounding boxes uh, into more specific categories like aeroplane, person, and so on. So in this type of typical approach, uh, the first stage, which is to propose these bounding boxes, is typically happening independently of what's going on in, in the second stage. Um, and what we propose to do in, in these reinforcement learning-based approaches is to consider a detection problem rather as a sequential decision-making problem. So it's still a two-stage approach, but crucially, the second stage should somehow inform also the first stage. So it's a little bit similar to this sort of this saccade and fixate video that we saw previously where you know you look somewhere and you try to somehow integrate information as you proceed and then somehow guides that guides your search process. So what characterizes these RL-based models is that they are 
sequential search trajectories inspired a little bit by this, this video or how humans do it, uh, which aggregates context as search proceeds. That means, for example, that the detection accuracy and where to look next is dependent on the history of what has been seen so far. Um, the search process is fully automatic in the sense that the number of fixations or the amount of time that we process each image depends on the complexity of the images. And also these detectors, they do not require more supervision than standard detection pipelines. So in the first paper uh, among these RL-based detectors, uh, that is the one that introduced these sort of fully automatic stopping conditions and so on. And you can also see an example of, of their model on one input image in this example. So it reminds you a little bit of this saccade and fixate video previously. So the orange circles correspond to where the model fixates in the image. And then the yellow one is the, the detected target, in this case, a boat. Um, one of the key findings is that this type of model is significantly faster than classic and exhaustive methods like sliding windows. Um, so that was a good thing. However, there were some limitations of the first paper, and which we would now look into the second paper in more detail in the coming slides. But these limitations include the fact that they train a separate uh, fixation policy for every object category. So if you have 20 different object categories, that will result in 20 policies, so to say. And also, uh, the reward design, etc., is mostly for single instance detection. So if you will have five boats in the same image, it's not certain that you find them all. And finally, the detection accuracy of this type of model is not as good as modern object detectors such as faster RSNN. So let's look at the second paper, uh, which is based at a high level on the first paper, but tries to improve it in various ways. So this is uh, an example of how that type of model would operate on an input image. The first step, you would compute some deep features uh, for your image, uh, and then you would make your first decision. And the first decision is to essentially do some sort of fixation. In this case, it fixates close to the person on the motorcycle, <coughs> and then locally around that area, it finds, in this case, a person. The model also has a history of what it has seen so far. So based on, for example, it sees the person, now knows that and it can guide it where it looks next. For example, then it decides to look slightly below to detect the motorcycle on which this person is sitting. The process would repeat until the model automatically decides to terminate and at this point it could do some fine adjustments to its detections uh, before the detection process is completed. So just very coarsely looking at how this works is in the bottom left, you see the full model architecture. Uh, we won't go into the details, but it is based on this faster RSNN detector, which is arguably the most common object detector. And you can see components of that to the right. And since it is based on that type of model, it contains some base features from, from that type of model. So it has a deep feature map, for example. And it also has some information from, from this type of model, which includes essentially uh, some sort of objectness measure of what it sees in the image. And then it also has a class-specific history, which we'll look at now, because this history is kind of a coarse representation of what has been seen in the image and where. So, for example here, you, you divide an image into a set of bins, if you will, and then the history would then keep track of roughly where in the image did it see and what did it see. So, for example, the motorcycle was roughly seen, no, sorry, the person was roughly seen in the middle and the motorcycle in the bottom part of the image. Um, as for the reward design, we would like this model to balance two things. On the one hand, we would like the model to find all the objects. So this fairly complicated sum of things here is related to simply finding ground truth bounding boxes of the various objects. So if you if you go somewhere and you find uh, several objects that would be highly rewarded. On the other hand, we would not we would like the model to stop as soon as possible. So it, again, it has this automatic stopping condition. So we add also a penalty for every fixation. We call it minus beta. So for a high beta, you would sort of emphasize that you should stop very soon. And for a low beta, it might fixate a bit more to be certain to have found all the objects. Rather than treating this beta as a hyperparameter, as one would typically do, is 
we treat it as a model input. What this means is that the detection model can become aware of its speed accuracy trade-off, if you will. So during training, we sample different datas all the time. For some images, you know, it has a high penalty, and for others, it may have, might have a low penalty. And that means that the deep neural network that we have, it learns to adapt to that parameter in addition to the image content. So for example, this could result in something like this, where for a small expiration penalty, you would have a lot of fixation, so you really get accurate detections. And then as you sort of increase that penalty, you would maybe have fewer and slightly less accurate detections during test time. And uh, here we see just some of the results from the paper. Uh, let's focus on one part. So what we see in this plot is a few things. The uh, blue line, that's the standard foster Australian model upon which their model is based in some ways. And then you have the red line on the top, so to say. That is the main model proposed is automatically stopping uh, fixation policy. And then you also have this uh, yellow curve, which is a variant of their proposed model, but at every sort of point on this yellow curve, you force the model to take exactly that number of fixations. So for example, at the five, you would then have a model which in every image performs exactly five fixations. And that is to compare a little bit. So what do we see from this slide? Well, we can see that the proposed models, sort of the red model and the yellow, both of them are better than the baseline blue model. Uh, uh, but it takes some time for the, this yellow model to, to get to that point. So that, that's after six fixations for the yellow one. Comparing the automatic, sort of the red model, to the non-automatic, which is the yellow model, um, we see that there is a gap in performance when you compare at the same number of fixations. So it turns out that from training, their auto model has on average four fixations per image. In some images it might be two, and in others it might be eight, but on average it's four. And if you compare that to the model which in every image does four fixations, then you have a, some gap in this detection performance where the red is better than the yellow. Similarly, if you look at the other axis, uh, you notice that the yellow model would actually have to use seven fixations to match the other one, which it all already gets at four fixations. So these, in, in summary, these really show the merits of having this automatic termination based on image complexity and so on. We conclude this first part with some qualitative examples of, of that detector. So key features here are that, you know, the number of fixations indicated with these white rectangles, that varies depending on the number of objects or in general the scene complexity. Uh, and we can see overall that, you know, in these examples that the objects of interest are being found. So that concludes this part of the thesis. So we now proceed with the second part, which is about active human pose estimation. And to motivate this formulation, consider a typical scenario in the case of human pose estimation. So a standard pipeline would be given some sort of input image, such as this one to the left. And the system, which would simply be given that image and have no con uh, control of uh, what image it obtains, would simply have to make a guess or make the best it can out of what it sees. And the problem with uh, 3D human pose estimation is that it has a lot of inherent challenges, such as partial visibility, which means, for example, you have the guy to the left who is only partially visible, and there could also be occlusions from other people and objects and so on. There's also the problem of depth ambiguity, which means that from a single image, it's not possible to really produce an absolute 3D pose estimate. But what if we set this agent free instead and let it actively decide where to look next in some scenario? Such a system would be able to integrate what it has seen over time and try to make an even better guess based on all the viewpoints that it sees as it intelligently moves around the scene. So such a model is able to adapt to any inherent limitations given its perception model, in this case, human pose estimation system. So that's the task that we consider in this paper. And so sort of for experimentation and evaluation, we consider a data set which is called panoptic. And you can see an example to the right of, of this data set. It's kind of a spherical dome on which you have a lot of cameras which are synchronously filming various sequences of multiple or single people that are performing actions or post demonstrations 
so that's a very good test bed for, for doing this type of research. And essentially, there are two things of mind for such an agent <clears throat> which would like to look around. So, you know, how many viewpoints should we select and where should we look? So this is an example maybe of some cameras selected by such a system. And the question would also be how many, like when should we stop? And ideally, we should only select a few viewpoints because using these deep human post estimation system is expensive. Uh, and we would also like to stop sooner rather than later for another reason, which is that some viewpoints may be very difficult for the post estimation system. So it's not just about speed, but also about accuracy, as we shall see. So looking at the high level view of a task description here, so you're given a, a random first viewpoint of a scene which contains one or multiple people. And you now freeze the time, so to say, because you have these cameras that are simultaneously filming, but let's look at a single time instant now. So the agent moves around and selects new viewpoints to produce a post estimate for this frame. And then it automatically decides, now I'm done with this frame, let's move on to the next time step. So the process would then repeat in the next time step, it will move around and automatically decide when it is done. And then, you know, as this multi-video stream is complete, we would then have a sequence of post estimates that should ideally be as accurate as possible. So there are two approaches considered in the thesis. So the first paper about this is a self-supervised active triangulation approach. So triangulation is, is good for one reason, and that is if you have a 2D estimation system, which produces 2D estimates on different images, then you can use just classic camera geometry to produce the corresponding 3D estimates of what you see. And the key question is then how to efficiently select these viewpoints to, to get the triangulation as soon as possible. And one of the key things in the paper is that, again, this self-supervised type of reward, which doesn't require any 3D ground truth, but is based only on the 2D key point detector, so to say. And the second type of approach is directly operating with these monocular 3D post estimators. And that faces different challenges. And also, they consider uh, two sort of quite different formulations of the task in this paper. And this model also has fully automatic stopping conditions in different from the other paper. So due to time constraints, we will focus on this paper on the coming slides. So this is an overview of that model. So you have some sort of policy, which is a deep reinforcement learning agent, which is given some viewpoint again, and it has to move around. So you have a monocular 3D post estimation system, which you would like to look from different viewpoints. And the policy has some sort of state representation, which is based on the deep feature representation from the post network, as well as a sort of a rough history of the different post estimates that it has currently predicted. It also knows where roughly on this viewing sphere it has been. And using that state, it then decides where to look next on this viewing sphere, as well as when to terminate for the current time step in this multi video stream. So for the reward, we have two types. One is for the viewpoint selection. So the main component of that reward is to encourage low reconstruction error at the end of the episode. So you know you have some random initial viewpoint, and based on that you get a rough estimate, and you would like to improve as much as possible over the different viewpoints. So that's that reward, and you would also like to penalize visiting the same viewpoint multiple times. And as for the other type of reward, which is you know, determination action, that also has the same thing, which we would like to have low reconstruction error at the end. But we also have an explicit uh, term which penalizes not terminating soon enough. Because as we shall see, some viewpoints may actually be really bad. And, you know, the agent should stop before the post estimator hits a viewpoint where it is bad, so to say. We consider it again in two different formulations, one of which is a single target setup. There you have a given target person indicated with a red bounding box, potentially surrounded by other people who would then be more occluding that person. And what we will now see is an actual qualitative example of our agent for this, this example. But you, you, know, you get your first random viewpoint and <clears throat> you have to produce some sort of estimate which is poor in this example, for example, because of the partial visibility of that person. The agent then automatically moves to the next viewpoint and this was a much better one, and which also resulted in a much better post estimate.
in this example, they didn't they ter terminate it already after the second viewpoint. The other type of setup is the one which you would like to have a single viewpoint trajectory which reconstructs simultaneously all people in the scene. And we see again a qualitative example of our agent as it moves around. And in this example, it selected six viewpoints before termination. And let's zoom in on sort of some, some targets here. So we take this, this guy who is standing something posing like that with his hand under his cheek. And you can see clearly that in the sixth viewpoint to the bottom right, the pose is clearly the most accurate. The other ones it doesn't work at all for. And uh, similarly, if we look at the other targets, you can see also that that person's pose estimate is best at the end. By the way, it didn't even recognize these people from the first viewpoint, so it really had to look around to find all the targets. So those are two types of setups that we consider. So let's now move on to the quantitative results. So uh, we first look at a single target setting with one person potentially occluded by other people. And uh, the, we have a few different models that we compare. So the blue one is our own model. Uh, and the purple one is kind of an oracle which excessively cheats by looking at the ground truth to select viewpoints. So it's a really an upper bound on performance. And then we have the red and yellow one, which are heuristic baselines. But where the yellow one is one which kind of really spreads out maximally to try to get diverse viewpoints. So it's a fairly strong baseline to compare to. So what do we see from this plot? Well, all of the models sort of essentially improve their estimates as they look at more viewpoints, which makes sense. However, if we look at our, our proposed model, we have also drawn the accuracy that you get, <clears throat> or sort of the, the error that you get in the auto stop mode, which is a dashed line approximately at 3.9 viewpoints. So it's similar to that first part of the thesis with the detection model that stops automatically, but here it stops automatically with respect to the number of viewpoints. And you can see actually that at 3.9 on average, it's better than any even higher number of fixations, even better than at, let's say, eight fixations or viewpoints, sorry. Um, so that really indicates the need for having this automatic termination, not only because it saves computation time, but actually because it learns to stop before the post estimator gets to some really poor viewpoints, which doesn't really improve performance. Moving on to the multiple target setup, where we reconstruct all people in the same trajectory, um, we see similar trends overall. But we, we also see that the auto stop model has some potential, but it's not as crucial as for the single target setup. And probably the key reason for that is that if you should reconstruct all people simultaneously, you don't, I mean, some viewpoints are good for some people and other viewpoints are good for other people. So it makes more sense to actually select more viewpoints to get some views which are good for at least some of the people all the time. And finally, we look at the run times where we see that the Oracle, which by the way cheated, is super slow, really impractical. Um, but for the model that we propose, it is virtually as fast as these heuristics, even though it was more accurate as we saw. So we now move on to the final part, which is about embodied visual active learning. So um, there has been a recent trend towards embodied AI, which means that we would like to attach our computer vision systems, not just uh, sort of for static images and so on, but attach them to robots and similar entities that could then move around in houses and other environments to do various tasks. So here you have some examples in a photorealistic simulator about some first person agent that moves around in different buildings and performs tasks such as finding different objects or rooms in the building and answering other types of questions. So in this thesis, uh, a new type of embodied task is proposed, which is called embodied visual active learning. They also consider a first person agent that moves around in different buildings and which has some sort of perception model, in this case, a semantic segmentation system attached to it. The task of this agent is to move around their building and only sparsely ask for annotations so that this perception model is improved. And the reason it should be sparse is because annotation is typically an expensive process. So the perception model can, in the most general case, be any, anyone, but again, it's semantic segmentation in the context of, of this work. 
And as we already said, um, one of the motivations for this type of task is that uh, it's very expensive with the annotation process, but also that a perception model may fail to generalize to new circumstances. So again, if you have trained your system in for, from some sort of random images from the internet, it's, it's not at all clear why it should generalize to much uh, context that differs much from that. So let's now have a look at how this task is sort of tackled. Uh, so in, in the paper, they propose a various methods ranging from heuristic to fully learnable one. And let's look at the fully learnable one, which is based on reinforcement learning now. So you have a policy pi of theta, which can predict two types of actions, one of which is the movement action, which allows the agent to move around the building and explore. And this exploration is rewarded during the training of the RL agent. As the agent moves, its current segmentation mass that it has annotated most recently is actually sort of propagated to where the agent moves based on optical flow. So that's also part of the agent's state space. And the state space also contains the current viewpoint, just RGB image, as well as its current prediction for that, like the its own prediction of this semantic segmentation mass. The other type of action that the policy can predict is a perception action which allows us to refine its current perception model. There are two types of perception actions, one of which is annotate, which essentially you could see it as the agent asks some human in the loop, if you will, in principle. It asks for the ground truth information for that viewpoint. And this is penalized in training because annotations are expensive. There's also another variant of it, which we call collect, which gathers sort of this propagated lost annotation mask to the training set. And that is sort of free. And you can then see the training data sort of grows adaptively as the agent queries more data to the right. And that is then used to refine the perception model. So both of these types of perception actions, annotate and collect, those are rewarded based on this increase in perception performance, based on that, how informative the data was that it annotated. Moving on now to the results of, of this paper is that we will now compare a few models. Uh, again, we designed a few of them. Uh, we evaluate it on a photorealistic simulator called Matterport 3D. So the first curve, you see the number of steps, the number of actions really, taken by the agent versus the MIOU, which is a, a kind of an accuracy metric for the segmentation system. Higher is better. So what do we see from this type of plot? Well, if we first compare the orange RL agent curve to the green frontier exploration, uh, we can see that this method, which is sort of the runner up compared to the RL agent, uh, the RL agent is better than that one, but it also annotates 31% less. And the other methods below the green ones, let's say, are even worse in MIU, and they also annotate more than the RL agent. So this shows that the RL agent is more efficient in terms of its data, data annotation process. We also compare to, in some sense, an upper bound, or like uh, almost can almost be seen as an oracle with respect to the exploration, where we see that that one is better than the RL agent, but it also annotates a lot more. So, um, yeah, so that's the summary of this type of result. And we then compare to another type of similar curve, but where we have replaced the x axis with the number of annotations instead. We now see that for the early part, up to about 17 annotations, the RL agent is the best. And it's a bit interesting because during training, the agent learned to annotate about 17 times on average. So you can see that sort of up until that operating conditions that it learned in training, that's when it sort of performs the best in some sense. But then as, you know, as, as we increase the number of annotations, the space filler uh, just does become better. And uh, overall, we can see that for both these types of comparisons, we see the same relative rankings, where in summary, we see that the RL agent obtains higher MIU than comparable methods. The space filler is not really comparable, it's more an upper bound, uh, but, but it also does that by annotating less on average, is what we have seen. So we have seen that the learnable system is in some sense the most adaptive uh, model in that sense. So that concluded now the third part, and actually it concludes now the whole thesis presentation. So let's have a look at the summary and conclusions overall for this thesis. And we go back to this, one of the initial slides, which showed some sort of drawbacks or 
slight weaknesses of the contemporary deep neural networks for visual perception. So uh, let's see how these things were addressed throughout the thesis now. So if we look at the first item about these large data sets, well, in the just the recent part, part three that we looked at, we saw that uh, intelligently selecting which viewpoints to annotate can allow for more efficient uh, data sets, which could be made a bit smaller and more informative. Uh, and also the fact that training data can be actively requested as opposed to being you know, a static and predefined data set. And then we have this middle item about the adaptability. So again, part three addresses parts of this because you know, this RL-based system is able to sort of refine those parts where the perception model is weak. So it definitely is adaptive with respect to its perception model. So it requests annotations for uh, things where it is most uncertain. Moving on to the earlier parts of the thesis, part one and two also addresses this part because those are adaptive in their computation times. We saw that the number of fixations for the detection model and the number of viewpoints for the human post estimators uh, were adaptive, automatic stopping, so to say. And the RL-based methods are also potentially able to adapt to inherent limitations or weaknesses of their given perception model. For example, in the post estimation work, we saw this auto stop model, which gave the lowest error because it learns to stop before its post estimator moves to a viewpoint, which is not so good. And uh, other insights we saw was that, for example, for the human post estimation systems, we saw that we were able to have the same overall pipeline, which is adapted with respect to sort of the specific task formulations and uh, for the, we, we could do sort of active triangulation or direct post estimation, and we could consider single and multiple targets and so on with kind of small changes. Uh, and also we saw that uh, one of the detectors proposed has sort of an adaptable speed accuracy trade-off uh, at test time. We saw this penalty which could be fed to the policy. And for the third part, we have this uniform and exhaustive processing and we now say that we have addressed some of that too in the first parts of the thesis. Because again, going back to that, that we have this adaptive computation time. So obviously it is able to avoid redundant computation. Again, looking at the post estimators, for example, it simply skips some of the viewpoints uh, and stops sooner rather than later, and similarly for the detector. And also, again, that these RL methods can learn to adapt to any limits of their given perception models. So maybe the detector focuses on certain parts of the image where, where sort of the second part of the detector is most accurate, and so on. So that concludes the overall presentation, and this is just, again, showing this big picture uh, representation of, of what the thesis is about. So thanks a lot for listening, and let's move on uh, now with this defense.